Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, December the 29th, 2020. It is currently 10.09 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church, located right here in Ovalo, Texas. Now, I'm going to try over the next few hours to produce as many uh, episodes as I possibly can, covering as many topics as I can. And one of the reasons I really need to produce as many episodes as I can today is because, well, things are about to change here in West Texas. Right now outside, it's almost 70 degrees. It's cloudy. There's a chance for rain. But at some point, things are supposed to change because right now they are predicting. Now, I have not looked lately. I haven't looked recently, but the last time I checked, they are predicting that tomorrow we're going to get this wintry mix of ice, sleet, possibly snow, and that could limit my ability to come back to come back out here to the church tomorrow and do any live broadcasting and really and produce anything for the Wednesday evening service. It could really mess everything up. So, I really need to get as much done today as possible and hopefully I can produce some things that I think um, are are greatly beneficial. Yesterday, I was a little frustrated. Um, I, I went back and tried to fix what I attempted on Sunday. And if you if you were listening uh, on Sunday here at Victory Baptist Church, everything went horribly wrong uh, because I had two seizures in the middle of doing live broadcast. It was it was a disaster. It was a train wreck, and I, I still don't remember everything that happened. But I yeah, I finally got home. And uh, yeah, Sunday was bad. So yesterday I came out here to try to to try to make up for what went wrong on Sunday. And one of the things I tried to do was look at the at this idea of four things we need in 2021. And I, I think there are some very important concepts that I tried to articulate in that message. I just don't think I ever really pulled it all together. And then. In a in a quality way, I guess that's in a in a, in a correct way. So um, I hope I hope that was beneficial. I was still frustrated by it, but I I did the best I could. Um, that was something that I ended up trying to do on Sunday, and uh, everything went horribly wrong. So I just felt obligated to try to go back to it on Monday and and try to fix it. Still not great, but but hopefully there's some principles and some ideas in that that you can think about, you can meditate on, and maybe maybe you can take the, the initial study that I did and then you can work on it and maybe you can clean it up and, and make it even better for your own personal study and your own uh, personal edification. And, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that will occur. Now, today we're going to be tur- uh, turning for this first live episode that we're doing here at Victory Baptist Church this morning. We're going to be turning to a, a a subject that is going to prove to be controversial. It's going to pro- uh, prove to make a lot of people angry, but I hope you will at least hear me out. I hope that you will at least consider what I have to say, all right? Now, because it's December the 29th, all right, because it's December the 29th, that tells you, that tells me that we're fast approaching, obviously, the end of 2020. And you know what everyone does at the end of a year. You look back at the previous year, right? You look back and and people create lists like the best movies of that year, the best songs released, the best albums, the best TV shows, uh, the most important uh, moments and the and news. It just everyone looks back and reflects on the previous year. And I want to take some time this morning for us to stop and look back over tw- uh, over the past year, over you know everything that happened in 2020, and I want to focus in on one specific thing. I want to talk about obviously the COVID 19 situation, the pandemic that swept across the world and has dominated discussions, debates um, all across the world throughout the year. And I want to look back over 2020, and I want to consider mistakes that were made in dealing with the the pandemic that in many cases made it far more worse, made it more tragic than it it possibly could have been, that that mistakes were made. Now, I know it's always easy in hindsight to look back and go, hey, look at the mistakes everyone made. It's, It's very difficult when you're right in the middle of a situation to always know exactly what steps to take and exactly you know, how to make those, uh, what what decisions to make and which one is the right and which one is the wrong. 
after the fact, you can always look back and go, oh, messed up there, messed up there. And and we always have to remember this was a novel coronavirus. This was a a new situation. And so clearly there there were going to be, uh, there there was going to be an understanding that people had at the beginning. And that understanding would ultimately change as more facts were learned, as more information became evident. So decisions made early, we can go, they made a mistake. Now, it still may have been the best decision they could make at the time with what they knew, but I still want to look back and consider the mistakes. And here's the reason why. As I want to look back, look at some of the mistakes made, and we'll say this, in the world by governmental leaders, uh, you know, uh, public health officials, whatever the case may be, look at some of those mistakes. But I want to look at those mistakes only, only, to kind of get us to the the topic that I really want to unpack, and that is this. I want you and I as Christians, this is a Theology Central podcast. We look at everything from a theological perspective. I don't don't try to look at things from a political perspective, but from a theological perspective. And, And so many times people who email me, they miss that point. They want to engage in a political argument. I'm like, you're missing the whole point of this podcast. It's called Theology Central. The the theology is what we try to make central here. I want to I want to consider some of the mistakes made by political leaders, public health officials, but I want to do that to get us to the bigger subject. And the bigger subject, the most important subject for me for this podcast, as I want Christians, I want pastors, I want church leaders, I want all of us to stop and go, what mistakes did the church make? What mistakes did the church make in dealing with COVID-19 in 2020? This is a time for reflection. This is, and look, you, look, let's at least acknowledge this, all right? We, uh, from a theological perspective, I would hope that all Christians acknowledge and believe that as human beings, we are sinful. We, ha- we have a sinful nature. We are sinners by nature. And because we're sinners by nature, then obviously we have a tendency to sin. We have a tendency to act from a, a perspective, from a selfish perspective. We have a tendency to think and act, obviously, in a very ungodly way. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Our natural inclination is not obviously godly. It's always to go in the opposite direction. And because that is true, because we confess and believe that about human beings, that the human heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, because we confess this belief in human depravity, then it should not be a shock that there's a very good chance that you, me, churches everywhere, that we all made mistakes in dealing with COVID. We have to at least acknowledge that. Now, the thing is, you acknowledge the mistake, but then you stop to go, okay, let's, acknowledge, let's, let's look. If we can acknowledge the fact that mistakes is a common thing because we're human beings, sin is a common thing because we're human beings, then I think it's important for us to stop and look back and acknowledge what those mistakes were and try to learn from them. I think this can be a, a, a point where we can learn some valuable lessons, but we can't learn those lessons if we're too sensitive to acknowledge anything. If we're too sensitive and we get mad and we get defensive, we've got to, we got to look back and see how did the church handle the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, and did we handle it correctly? And what mistakes were made? We know mistakes had to be made. We, we just know that because we believe in human depravity. So what were those mistakes? What, what mistakes do you think the church made in dealing with the COVID-19 situation? What mistakes do you think were, were made? Now, when I say churches, I'm just speaking of churches at large, right? Your, your church may handle it differently than other churches. But I think if you look at the city you live in, there's probably been a a, a pretty common theme in how most churches handled it. Do you think they handled it correctly? What mistakes do you think were made? Now, again, it's easy in hindsight to look back and go, ooh, look at all the mistakes they made. We're not, I'm not doing this to try to be super critical. I'm doing this to try to say, let's honestly look in the mirror. Let's honestly look in the mirror and go, what, what could we what could we have done better? And because we've got to now move into 2021 and we still don't know exactly what that year, what 2021 is going to look like. 
So we don't want the, the one thing we don't want to do is to go into 2021 making the exact same mistakes. We don't want to do that, and we want to see what mis- what we want to see what mistakes that were made. And then try to learn the lessons from those mistakes so that even if we face different situations, we don't commit and make this, the same kind of mistake just dealing with a different situation. All right. So I, I, I hope you'll not get defensive. I hope you'll not get upset. And please don't come. At, if you come at me from a political perspective, you want to argue politics, you're going to be missing the point completely. All right. So Hear me out. Let's try to make this all the way to the end. And then you listen to everything I have to say, then draw your conclusion. All right. I, that's the, I, I hate that I have to kind of offer <laughs> kind of a warning and try to help clarify the perspective and explain it because you would think when people see, oh, that's the Theology Central podcast. Oh, he's obviously looking at things from a theological perspective. You would think it would be obvious, but <laughs> when I, if you see my email, you would be like, uh, clearly they don't get it. And that's always frustrating, right? So then I have to waste the time to explain everything. So are you ready? Let, let me first set the stage, all right? The other day, I came across a fascinating uh, article, a fascinating article. I have it right here in front of me. I posted it in the chat for everyone in my church to read. I don't know if anyone actually read it, but I think I think it's fascinating, all right? It's called The Plague Year. The Plague Year, it's found in the New Yorker magazine. It's in the latest edition of the New Yorker magazine. It pretty much takes up the entire edition. Uh, you should definitely look for it. It's called The Plague Year in the New Yorker magazine. Uh, the uh, It says, The Mistakes and the Struggles Behind America's Coronavirus Tragedy. The Mistakes and the Struggles Behind America's Coronavirus Tragedy. It is a lengthy read. It is, I mean, it basically takes up the entire, uh, you know, edition of, of that magazine. And again, you can find it online and you should read it. it again, it's lengthy, but it really lays out kind of a timeline of how this is how it started and this is the steps people took and here's the mistakes people made and then this happened and this, this happened and it really gives you kind of a broad overview of everything that occurred. But as I was reading it, I couldn't help but keep, continue to think, well, wait a minute, if we were to write an article about all of the mistakes the church made, I wonder what would be in that, that article. I wonder what it would look like. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to listen to an interview with the author of this uh, article called uh, The Plague Year and the New Yorker magazine. I, I don't even really want to call it an article. This edition, really, it's, it, again, the, the one article takes up the whole edition pr- for the most part. The uh, author of this edition of the New Yorker magazine, that's a good way to put it. Um, I want you to hear what he has to say. Now, I don't think the interview is great. Um, I, you know, I, I wish that we kind of presented it in a little, in a different way where they really kind of took different parts of the, of the, uh, a, the again, not article, the edition of the New Yorker apart. I understand why it's difficult because I was thinking about creating a podcast episode where I worked through the article, but the article, I mean, again, the article is basically the entire edition of the magazine. So it's very difficult it's like, how do we break this down? Because there's so much information in there. But they will at least give you an overview of at least three mistakes that this author believes occurred in dealing with COVID-19. And it made it a greater tragedy than it could have been. Now, you can get into a whole argument with that author about the mistakes he points out. But we will listen to what he has to say. And then we're going to pivot from those mistakes that he outlines and then I've got my own outline of mistakes I believe the church and Christians made in dealing with COVID-19. All right. So here we go. This comes to us from the PBS News Hour. Um, and it's about how long, how long is it? About eight minutes long. And uh, we're going to listen to it. The, the audio quality is, is not great. It's, it's just because it's at a lower volume and I don't have the software in order to boost it. So you're going to get what you get, and uh, it's free, so don't throw a fit. Okay, that's that's what I always told my kids. You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. So I, I'm doing the best I can here. So, all right, just work with me. All right, you ready? Here we go. This is from PBS NewsHour interviewing the author of the edition of the New Yorker magazine that is called The Plague Year, where they look at the mistakes made 
uh, in dealing with the pandemic in 2020. Let's see what mistakes were made. Here we go. This week on America Interrupted from the PBS NewsHour, we explore a silent epidemic in the U.S., childhood trauma. The adversity we experience in childhood can leave lifelong emotional and physical scars. I just fell into the deepest, darkest place that I've ever been in my entire life. And COVID-19 is likely making children more vulnerable to harm. If we do not act thoughtfully and inclusively, we could see the effects of this pandemic on the health of a generation. Listen and subscribe to America Interrupted wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, I just go, I went ahead and put their little uh, podcast uh, ad there just because we're going to work through their content. So if they wanted to promote something, I thought, well, let, let them promote it here as well. So if you're interested, you can subscribe to that podcast. Just just thought I would uh, do that. When I when I use someone's content to kind of work through, if they've got something to promote, then, I, then I, I'm like, okay, go ahead and play their promotion as well. All right, so here we go. Now let's get to it. The time-honored tradition of casting back on the past 12 months at the close of the year is a somber occasion this year. The coronavirus pandemic brought untold hardship and suffering that in one way or another touched nearly every American in 2020 and millions more around the world. The New Yorker magazine devoted nearly its entire current issue to the subject this week. And in his piece, The Plague Year, staff writer and award-winning author Lawrence Wright chronicles some of the principal events and people of the pandemic and the effort to contain it. And he points to three critical moments when he says events might have turned out differently. Lawrence Wright, welcome back to the News Hour, and thanks for joining us. Those three critical moments, those mistakes, as you call them in your piece, they are basically a U.S. team being denied entry to China early in the pandemic, the failure of the U.S. government to have a testing plan and flawed tests being sent, and then the failure to support mask use. In your reporting, in every one now you can we, we can just stop right there. That failure for the U.S. team uh, to get in there, the problems with testing, and then the whole failure to get masking basically adopted and 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 used. And I know immediately that sparks an argument. You're going to start, no, the masks don't work, and and, and you're going to start. I, just please, okay, I, I'm I'm as someone who worked in the medical world for 22 years, I, I I'm just I'm just truly baffled how the mask have become such a divisive issue. I it I mean, for 22 years in the medical world, you know, hey, you got cold or flu symptoms, put on a mask. Uh, wear a mask for this, wear a mask for this. Hey, you're getting ready to go into that uh, room. You make sure you put on a mask. Okay, gotcha. You, you know, uh, put on certain protective equipment, depending on the type of patient you're dealing with, wash your hands. Yeah, just some of the basic things that were used in the medical world were never considered divisive or, you know, destroying someone's humanity, it was the mark of the beast. Uh, you know, you, you're trying to enforce your liberal agenda on us. It, it was never an issue. And then all of a sudden in 2020, the mask became like the, this lightning rod and, and, and people yelling at each other and fighting and, and, and division and, and, and just, that's one of the craziest things of 2020 uh, that that we have to deal with, and 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 we're gonna we're we're, we're gonna deal with that more in depth when we we look at this as the mistakes the church made. But those are some of the mistakes, the three major mistakes that is talked about. We'll, we'll let them kind of unpack uh, some of this. All right, but yeah, the the uh, China basically denying entry from the American uh, you know public health team to go in and kind of look at what was going on. The, uh, you know, the, the whole testing thing was a debacle at the beginning and, and all kinds of problems. And then the whole issue with mask and do you wear a mask and playing down mask and and just and just just we allowed it to become a, a, a divisive issue instead of uh, seeing this as, a, as as just one tool in the kit. You know, hey, here's one tool in our toolbox to try to fight the spread of this thing so we can get it under control. It was viewed, no, it's 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 a sign of tyranny and oppression. And it's just like when you see people just ranting on it, 
or or people like wanting to make some point. I, I don't wear a mask and I'm not going to wear a mask. And it's like, what what is going on? That that just tells you. I think that to me is just a, a one example of how things went so horribly wrong in dealing with COVID-19 and how it went so horribly wrong that, you know, well, over 300 and what, 40,000 people have died in the United States of America in less than a year, over a million people globally. Those numbers are going to continue to rise. We'll probably be over 400,000 dead Americans probably by the second week of January. That's what I've been predicting. I think that, I think we're on pace to get there. And uh, that's, that's a tragedy that should, that should bother everyone. So what, what went wrong? Well, let's, let's let them unpack this. Here we go. When you talk to how differently do you think things would be today if those three things had been done differently? Well, we, it still would have been a tragedy. It has been for every country, really. But the, 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 the dimensions of the tragedy are so much greater in America than anywhere else. We're really an outlier in the rest of the world. And had we taken advantage of the opportunities we had from the very beginning, uh, we would be in a lot better shape. There would be many more Americans who would be alive now. But starting with um, the very first thing, you know, when Redfield, the director of the Center for Disease Control, on January 3rd called his counterpart in China, George Gao, uh, Gao told him there was no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. And um, But the main thing was there's— the big secret that we didn't understand was that this was a not a, like a flu. This was something that spread mainly asymptomatically. The two other things you identified as, as mistakes were really strictly within the White House and the administration's control, and that was a failure to get out real tests, the flawed tests that they'd sent out um, around the country, and then a failure to support mask use. Now, you talked to a number of White House insiders, and what did they tell you about what led to those decisions and those failures? What was happening inside the White House? Well, it was a very divided White House. And, uh, you know, Matt Pottinger was the, uh, the deputy national security advisor, and he was the main advocate all along, even before the public health people got on board. Uh, the Treasury and, and the Office of Management and Budget, they were all frightened of doing anything that would uh, uh, disrupt the economy and so on. But Matt was pushing for travel bans and for mask use. And these were the two things that we could do before a vaccine arrived or any kind of real therapeutic. Matt put on a mask. He was the first person to put on a mask in the White House. And he said it felt like uh, wearing a clown nose. And people gawked at him. The president asked if he was sick. And he said, no, I just want to not be the guy that goes down in history for knocking off the president with COVID-19. You chronicle in a number of different ways, and it's striking to see how many of these anecdotes there were over the last year. The number of times that President Trump publicly downplayed the threat, said, you know, masks are voluntary and I don't think I'm going to be wearing one. Um, is it fair, though, you know, I wonder, because this is a, a once-in-a-century pandemic, and a lot of people point the blame towards the White House and towards President Trump. Is it fair to do that? There are things that he should be given credit for. I think warp speed was uh, a great success. You know, the, getting these vaccines out in record time, this is something that we should be uh, thankful for, especially for the scientists who developed that. Uh, and I think also we should give him credit for the travel bans, which were not part of the uh, orthodoxy of public health at the time. But, you know, I fault him on uh, two things. One was the politicization of our health institutions. Uh, essentially, the CDC and, and FA, FDA became captive agencies of the, of the propaganda wing of the Trump administration. And the other thing that is really you have to lay at the feet of the president, there's no national plan, even to this day. Uh, on March 11th, I think it was, the, the president was in a conversation with the 50 U.S. governors, and he said, you know, we'll, we'll be standing behind you. Uh, but then he explained what that meant. If you want to get PPE and that sort of thing, do it yourself. And uh, suddenly the governors realized it wasn't a national pandemic. There were 50 epidemics, and they were totally unprepared for this. 
you do tell a number of very intimate narratives about people at every stage in every different part of this pandemic and how they were affected, including those frontline healthcare workers that we've heard so much about who didn't have enough PPE, who remain on the front lines trying to save people's lives today. Uh, what stood out to you from your conversations with them? Oh, gosh, it's, you know, it's so touching because in the midst of this catastrophe that has, has taken such a toll on our country and our spirit, there have been a number of heroes. And I was privileged to have the opportunity to write about, you know, you know, start with the people that are on the front line in the, in the, in the health industry. Uh, Ebony Hilton, a, a, a young uh, black uh, anesthesiologist in, in uh, University of Virginia, uh, who is advocating so strongly for uh, ethnic, you know, better outcomes and ethnic disparities in healthcare. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to even begin, but Barney Graham uh, was the one who uh, developed the actual vaccine uh, that we're now getting into our arms. It, the vaccine that is both Pfizer and Moderna contain the same vital uh, protein that was designed by Barney Graham at the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases. Lawrence, it's really hard for many people to remember what the early weeks of 2020 were even like. And you call your piece the plague year, but it's it's fair to say we're still in it. The virus isn't done with us yet. So after yeah. looking at all the many strands of this, the political, the social, the medical, and so on, what do you think we can learn from all of those things that tell us about what our next year could look like? Well, I think this virus has been like an x-ray on our society, and it allows us to see all the broken places. And it could be that now that we're so aware of them, we'll do something to mend them. Um, healthcare, for instance, uh, you know, we're the only country in the world that separates clinical health care from public health. And it's lunacy to separate them. We should have a system that's unified. We should have people being able to turn to uh, get medical care as soon as they start to show any kind of symptoms at all. The, you know, also, I think a big part of what we have to fix is the disunity in our country. And it's a sad commentary that something like this, which should have brought us together, only drove us further apart. There are big challenges ahead for us as a nation, for sure. Lawrence Wright, your new piece, The Plague Year, is the entirety of the latest edition of The New Yorker. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Now, as I was listening, two words, well, three things really jumped out at me. I should say three things, not just three words, but three things. The first is there at the end, he said that, this really should serve like as an x-ray to show us where things are broken, where things are broken. And that's what, as Christians and as pastors, that's what we need to do. We need to stop and allow, look back at 2020 and go, let's allow this entire, everything that happened in 2020. We could talk about the election. We could talk about COVID, but let's specifically use COVID. We need to stop and look at how the church has used the COVID pandemic as an x-ray to, to be shown onto the church to reveal our brokenness, to reveal where we went wrong, to show us all the things that went, that went wrong so that we can learn from it. So we need to do an x-ray on the church and look at it. That's the first thing. This, the, the second thing was he talked about how the Trump administration kind of politicized and that, that really in many cases the public health sector and many of the, the medical side became politicized. And, and so now medicine became a political thing. Uh, the, 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 health, the, the health experts it became politicized and it became like, you know, so they're making a statement, but you're viewing it through a political lens, not through a health lens, not through a medical lens, not even from a scientific lens. It's like, oh, no, they're making a political statement and I disagree with them. So they're wrong. But you're you're viewing it from a political perspective and the politicizing of so much of COVID-19 has been so detrimental to the world, to our country for 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 the for human lives and that is a tragedy but here's what happens the politic the politi politicization the politi politicizing that's a good way of saying it the politicizing of health 
Well, it, it left not just the health world, not just the scientific world, not just the medical world. It, it came over to the church. The church has been politicized in its dealing with COVID-19, right? We have been politicized. And so much of what churches have said, so much of what churches have done, listen, has not reflected Bible, Scripture, Jesus. No, it's reflected a political ideological perspective. And I don't know why churches cannot see that. So much of what has been said, so many actions, so many things done by Christians and the church shows that they have been politicized, or you know my favorite term, politically hijacked, politically compromised, politically infected, all right? Using the kind of a, the analogy from a pandemic, you've been infected. You've been, you, you, it, look, politic, the politicizing of things, it's contagious, and the politicizing of things was happening all across America during the pandemic. And the church just opened its door and said, hey, bring in a little bit of that politicizing. Bring in the, the, the politics right through the front door of the church, right into the pulpit. And, I'll, trans- and I'll, I'll spread it from the pulpit to the pew. And then the people in the pew will spread it all over uh, social media. And the church was politicized during a pandemic and began to speak more from a political perspective and not a scriptural one. And every Christian, it should bother you greatly because that should never happen. So it, so the, so let me so go through these again. He's got his, he, he laid out his mistakes. We could talk about that all day, but I'm not here to get into that debate. I'm trying to take what he said and now pivot to look at the church. So he talked about it being used as an x-ray on the country to show our brokenness. We need to use the uh, the X-ray to show it upon the church and see where we were wrong and, and broke, uh, broken, where we have been broken. He talked about how it's pl- the politicizing of different, uh, you know, things happened during the pandemic. Well, that politicizing came into the church, and then he talked about the divisiveness, the division that that this showed how divided we were. Something that should bring us together only pushed us further apart. As a nation, now again, that's tragic. As a nation, that it, that it, that it divided us even more. But what's even more tragic is that this divisiveness once again came right through the front door of the church, entered into the pulpit, spread through the people in the pew, and then from the pew onto social media. That divisiveness came into the church, and the church became divisive. The church started beco- becoming uh, doing things from st- through from a perspective of strife and division and arguing and fighting. We begin to fight amongst ourselves. The, like here, the world is facing a pandemic. Over a million people have died. Over three hundred thousand people have died in the United States of America in a year. And if those people who were suffering, dying, facing economic hardship medical hardship, whatever they were facing, they could not look to the church to see a unified voice uh, about how we handle this. All they saw is the church is just as political, just as divisive as the world is. So what's the point of turning to the church? Because all I'm going to get is politics and divisiveness. I'm not going to get spirituality, scripture. No, I'm going to get all the same thing the world has. So the church doesn't even become It doesn't even look like an alternative. We're just as political and we're just as divided. And that is a condemnation upon the church. We should have been standing guard saying, no, 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 no politicizing. No, 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 no. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to fight against this divisiveness. There's enough divisiveness within Christianity from a theological perspective, we we have our differences in theology, but when we allow the politicizing of the church to occur, and then we allow that same divisiveness to come in because of the politicizing of everything, then we've been compromised. We've been infected. And the church needs to, to we, we need to uh, eradicate and remove this infection. All right, so... Those are some so those are some things that came to mind while I was listening to him. But I took a notebook and I wrote down. Sorry, that's my pencil. I wrote down five, 
five mistakes the church made in 2020 in regards to COVID-19. Here are my five. I would be more than happy to hear yours. You can email them to me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. We may go through all the ones that people send me, see if they're similar or different. If you if you send them to me and if, if you want me to use your name on the air, say that you can, or if you don't, just give me your list. I'll just give your list. Depends. We'll see. We'll see. It may lead to another episode. It may not, but I would love to get your, your list. I just took some time to really think about it. I, I was sitting here in my church and I just took a notebook and said, okay, what mistakes has the church made at large in regards to this? Here are the ones that I have written down. Number one, The church focused on rights over ministry and service. It became this, it it became that many churches started focusing on our rights, our rights. What are our rights? We, we're not going to give in. We want our rights. We're going to stand for our rights. And instead of the focus being on how can we minister to people? How can we serve people? What can we do in the middle of a pandemic? It became no, 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 no. Not what can we do to serve others? But what about our rights? Our rights. We're not going to let the government take away our rights. We're going to stand for our rights. We're going to fight for our rights. This is about our constitutional rights. Completely ignoring the biblical idea that in some cases you give up your rights. You may have the right to eat meat, but if eating meat causes your brother to stumble, you don't you don't eat that meat. Uh, meat offered unto idols idols is the uh, the exact uh, topic of discussion that I'm referring to in 1 Corinthians. And and one of the things, one of the emphasis in 1 Corinthians is everyone in the church was arguing and fighting about their rights. They wanted to, they wanted to be, uh, to display their spiritual gifts. They wanted this. They wanted their way. They wanted to fight about this. And it was this divisive church that was divided and they were fighting. And you know why? Because they were demonstrating themselves to be carnal and to be babies. They were babes. They were not, they were not showing spiritual maturity. And I think in many cases, COVID-19 has demonstrated that the church is made up of a lot of spiritual babies who all they want is their way. They don't stop to go, how can we serve people? How can we minister? No, 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 no. Our rights. You can't tell us what to do. Well, wait, instead of worrying about your rights, instead of worrying about you being told what to do, why weren't you worried about other people? Why weren't you worried about ministering to people and serving people? Now, some churches had greater ability to minister and serve to people versus uh, other churches. If you're very small, there's there's very little you can do. But if you're a large church, you could have said, okay, what what can we do? Contact the the local hospitals. What can we do? What can we do? You know, um, know, can we create a fund that, you know, if, if people have to pay to test, can we create a fund so that we can cover as much testing as possible that people who, even if they don't have the money, can c- come to your hospital and get tested for COVID-19? Like, what what can, uh, uh, how how has COVID impacted uh, employment in our town? Okay, well, man, we've got a massive unemployment rate going on and people are going to need food. Okay, what can we do to support the food banks? What can we do to, uh, to food pantries? What, like, big churches that had a Lots of resources could have been focusing on that, but it seems that the focus was on, no, you're not going to tell us what to do. No, we're not going to stay open. It's our rights, our rights, our rights, our rights. And it should have been like, our focus should have been on ministry and service. You do what you can. All right. Um, We're limited here being a little small church with, you know, not a lot of people and definitely not a lot. You know, we definitely don't have a lot of money. Um, but one thing I, I tried to do is during the pandemic, it's like, I'm going to turn on this microphone and provide as much spiritual teaching as I can. I did, I, I did that series on, you know, catech- catechesis during a pandemic. I tried to like, here, let's, let's, hey, let's work through the imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. Let's work on this. Let's study this. Let's study this. Let's think about this so that people, if they were locked down or whatever the case may be, or if they were missing out on teaching from their church, that I could provide as much as I could. That's the best I could do. But every church should have looked at what resources they had and been focused on how they can minister and serve people. How can they minister and serve people? Think about this in the New Testament. Whenever the Apostle Paul found himself in prison, right? You can look at the prison epistles, the epistles that he wrote while he was in prison. 
Do you ever see him ranting and raving uh, in those letters about his rights and his rights being violated and and the government is, you know, was wrong and that this. It, it, no, he spent most of his time in those letters doing what? Trying to minister to other people trying to minister to churches, writing to those churches, encouraging them, teaching them. That's what he, he focused, he didn't focus on his rights. He didn't focus on his rights being violated. He focused on what he could do to minister to people. That, that's the New Testament model. It wasn't like, oh, I've been exiled to the island of Patmos. You know what I'll do? I'll write an entire book on how I'm being persecuted by this evil government. No, I'm going to allow God to use me while I'm in exile to write a book dealing with uh, possible future events and end time events and eschatology. Again, depending on how you interpret the book of Revelation. But I'm just saying anytime the, the New Testament writers were in a prison or in some kind of difficult situation, they used that opportunity to minister, not to simply rant and rave about, you know, you want to fight, you've got to fight. Oh, you you want to come at us? We're going to take a stand. And 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 like we're in some kind of playground battle and we're going to see which one which person is the is is the you know the alpha dog, you know, whose yard is it going to be? It's like when did the church start talking like that? Instead of going, okay, okay, look at everyone. Uh we're in a, a difficult situation. There's this pandemic spreading. People are getting sick. Okay, let's not focus on us. How can we minister and serve? If you don't see that as a mistake, then I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're not considering, you're not looking at the situation in light of the New Testament. Minister, serve, right? Minister and serve. Jesus didn't hang on the cross and rant and rave that he, he was there. He was placed upon that cross in an unjust way. Even while on the cross, he was trying to minister. He prayed for the forgiveness of those. I mean, look at all the things Jesus said on the cross. That, that's, that's the model ex, uh, given to us in Scripture over and over and over. No matter what is happening to us, our focus is on ministry and serving others, not about fighting about us and what, oh, we were done wrong. And it's like that's what the church turned into, right? So there's the first major mistake. We focused on, on our rights uh, over ministry and service. Second, we focused on money over principles, Much of the church focused on money over principles. And let me just give you one clear example. $7.3 billion, that's a B, not an M, that's a B, $7.3 billion from the government went to churches and ministries uh, in form of the PPP loans, the Paycheck Protection Program loans. And they, those loans were going to be forgiven if, if they used, I can't remember the percentage, a certain percentage to do certain things in the church. Now, what those loans were designed for is, hey, look, your church, you're going to be shut down during the pandemic. You're not going to be able to pay your staff. You're not going to have as much money coming in. Now, we're going to give you this money so that you can, can keep that, st- you know, keep your staff employed. You don't have to lay anyone off. Now, we could, we could talk all day about this. One, why was the church taking money from the government? One, why was the church taking government uh, money from the government? Why? I mean, that, that's, that's a very important question. Why was the church taking money from the federal government? Why would we do that? I mean, why, why would, would, don't you think that that's just a, a, a very bad, a bad situation? Why would you do that? And then many of the churches, listen, took that money from the government and then Open, still open their doors and had everyone coming in. Now, wait a minute. If you're taking money from the government because you're not going to be able to be open, you're going to be closed down, and this is the way you can keep your staff employed, and then you're going to go ahead and open the door, and then you open the door, and then you stand behind the pulpit and yell and scream that you're being persecuted, and they're out to get you. Well, they gave you billions of dollars. At that point, you, you, you stopped worrying about principles a long time ago. You're bearing false witness. You're not even being honest. You're being disingenuous. And it's a, it's a, it's a sham. It's a scam. Hey, let's, let's use the fact that they're out to get us so that we can get more money while we take the money from the people we say is out to get us. 
Hey, guys, the, the, the government's out to get us. Now, they gave us $7.3 billion. I just want you to make sure you understand that's not how persecution works. <laughs> the government doesn't persecute you by giving you $7.3 billion. But that's like it, it was just this weird thing that, that, that churches did. They took the money, opened up. What, what the whole reason you were given the money is because they, you could sustain yourself without being open so that you wouldn't become a, a possible source of community spread and you wouldn't possibly be helping contribute to overwhelming hospital systems. But they took the money, then opened up, and then, well, then people could give them more money and then tried to claim in many cases that the very people that gave them the money was trying to, you know, was taking away their constitutional rights and trying to shut them down. Can you not see the the, the whole like how fraudulent all of that is. Joel Olstein's church uh, in, in, in Houston, $4.4 million they received. The, the, uh, a church right here, uh, right near my house in Abilene, Texas, Beltway Park, I think received, I think I would have to verify, but I believe they received a million dollars. Other church, I mean, I think over 300 churches in the Abilene, Texas area received PPP money from the federal government. There's a database. You can check churches in your area or you can do a search for churches in my area that receive PPP loans. And you have to ask yourself, why did these churches receive this money? Why would they take it? Why would they take it? Why? Because it was, it became about money. And here's, here's, I'll give you an example. I think in many churches, even churches that did shut down, what did they start doing? They started doing these drive-in church services, right? And they tried to argue that it was for all this spiritual reason. Well, at least we can be together. Even if we can't be together inside the church, we can all be in our car, in the parking lot, listening to a sermon. And it's like, what, what's even the point? But you know what the point was? So that someone could walk to your car, tap on the window, you would roll the window down, and boom, put money in an offering plate. Because it was about money. The focus became about money. I think so much of churches reopening had more to do with money and financial concerns and, and than it had to do with principles. Now, yes, I, I'm worried every week goes by at, at my church. I mean, I don't even I, I don't even know. Maybe January? I don't even know the last time money was put in the offering plate here at this church. I have no idea. I don't know. Now, as far as I know, I have not been told. I, I don't have access to the bank account. I don't know how much money is there. I haven't checked. But I, as far as I know, people in my church are giving electronically in different ways. We haven't, I haven't sent out letters begging for money. You know, I haven't, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping people are giving. But because, but here's the thing. Your focus can't be on money. Focus needs to be on principles. I don't want to take money from the federal government. We're a church. Operate as a church. The church operates through the giving of the people, the free will, willing giving, like that. Not not because they're manipulated or, or by constraint, but they freely, joyfully give. But churches took seven point three billion dollars. That that's that's gonna have to be looked back in history as what was the church doing? And then listen, here's what's crazy. The churches take the money and then say, we're not going to follow any other rules. We're not going to do social distancing. We're not going to wear a mask. We're going to open our doors. Wait, you took the money from the government, but then you don't want to follow the rules. (sighs) So, hey, your, your, your money is good enough for us just not your rules. Your rules, because we don't trust your rules because you're all crazy and you're all idiots and, you know, all your medical degrees are fraudulent. We don't trust any of your medical experts, but man, we sure like that money, 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 money. I think you can look back and it's going to be, man, what was the church doing in 2020? We were focused on money over principles. And the church needs to repent of that. We focused over our rights, We focused on rights over ministry and service, and we focused on money over principles. And if your church took PPP money, you should at least know. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you to leave your church, but you should at least be made aware of it. You should check and find out. And if you did, you've got to process that. And then ask yourself if your church took the money, and then now they're not following any of the rules, 
That should concern you because that to me is just duplicity and hypocrisy. And and then if they took the money and then opened back up immediately or never closed, but yet they took the money, wait a minute. Why did they need the money if you were going to continue to meet normally? That's like, hey, we're going to continue to meet normally so that people can continue to give, but yet we're going to take more money on top of it. Whoa, whoa. So this was a chance to get, you know, some more money so you can make some building improvements or pay off things? Like, I, I, that... There, 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 to me, there's some major issues with the, the, how that all went down, all right? And, and, and we reported, you know, on churches that took the money and then they decided to send it back, but they still took it. They still applied for it. Why? All right? I mean, they, the government just, did, trust me, the government didn't just send a check to every church, all right? Because if it did, we sure didn't get one, all right? All right? Now, you had to apply for it, all right? So there's number one. Uh, churches focused on uh, rights over ministry, Riot rights, rights, not riots. Yeah, my my Texan is coming out in me. Focused on rights over ministry and service. Number two, focused on money over principles. And again, seven point three billion in PPP loans went to religious uh, churches and organizations. And well, yeah, we could talk all day about that. Number three, here we go. We focused on politics over scriptural principles. Our, our, we'll put it this way because I used principles in the in the previous uh, point. We'll we'll state it this way: focused on p- uh, politics over scripture. Focused over politics over scripture. What do I mean by this one? Here's what happened: the churches started going. Well, the government's not going to tell me what to do. The government's not going to tell me what to do. Ooh, I I've stated this a million times. Why did we ever worry about what the government was saying? What we should have said is: wait a minute. Okay, we're in the middle of a pandemic. People are getting sick. People are dying. Healthcare system could get overwhelmed. Healthcare system, the healthcare world is asking us to do this and do this and do this. Okay, what should we do as followers of Jesus Christ? We have certain fundamental principles that, are, that should be true of Christians, right? We believe all human life is sacred. We believe in the sanctity of human life. So we don't want to do anything that's careless that would harm human life, take human life, we, because we're pro-life. We want to protect life. We're not to do anything through strife and vainglory. We are to place others before ourselves. We are to love our neighbor. We are to love even our enemy. So what things can we do? Instead of focusing on pop from what, you know, from a political standpoint, oh, the politicians are saying this and we're going to go against it or, or, or we're going to go for it because the politicians are saying this. The politics should have never come into mind. A clear, careful application of all scriptural principles should have been utilized, right? Okay, well, forsake not the assembly, okay? Well, the Bible does say forsake not the assembly, but let's look at how we've conducted ourselves as a church over the last 24 months. How many times have we canceled churches for this, or we canceled church for this, or we we reduced services for this? We've, we've, we've subtracted services and canceled services for a, a number of reasons. So how how... How strong are we on this passage? How do we typically apply this passage? We can't, because we can't come up with an application of not forsaking the assembly now that we haven't been consistently applying previously. That should have been a question every church asked, all right? How do we also consider these other principles of thinking of others and not just ourselves? How do we show love for our community? How do we heed the, the, uh, the advice and warnings from the health of officials? What, what can we do? And I've stated it so many times, churches could have come up with so many ideas, multiple services, limiting the number of people, mask, canceling some services, using online technology, using podcast technology, using every every tool at their at at their disposal to do what they can. But they 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 stopped it, it, it stopped becoming a scriptural issue and it started becoming a political issue because when people started standing in the pulpit and saying things that sounded like they came from Trump's Twitter account and they came from a political leader and not from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul. You know, it, it didn't like sound like it come from the Bible. It sound, sounded like it came from their political affiliation. You knew we were in trouble. We started focusing on politics over scripture. We should have been sitting there with the Bible. And remember early on, I I tried to give everyone like a a COVID scripture toolkit. 
Here are the scriptures you have to consider in figuring out what you're going to do with COVID. And I gave a number. And one of the big ones, one of the big ones that I repeated over and over and over and over again, and I have it right here, is Philippians 2. I don't know how many times I read this scripture. So many times. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he, they give the example of Christ and his incarnation. Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but laid everything aside, took on the form of a servant. Why? He, he in a sense, gave up rights for other people's benefits. That's the model that's set up for us. But we started sounding like a political party instead of a church. So the first mistake the church made focused on rights, rights over ministry and service. Number two, focused on money over principles. Number three, focused on politics over scripture. Number four, focused on strife over unity. Focused on strife over unity. We, the, the church began to focus on becoming more and more divisive in its language and its arguing and it's fighting instead of like, let's be unified. Like, let's be unified because it's just crazy. I, I, I don't know how many times I've seen Christian, someone, Christians saying different things in different formats and different loca- places where it's basically like, you know what? Um, if your church uh, tells you to wear a mask or if your church cancels service, get out. Don't trust them. Don't, they're, they're, they're of Satan. Leave them. And it's like, why are we, why are we talking that way? If you're, if you're in a church, listen, if you're in a church, look, just think about COVID, the reality of COVID. People are getting sick and dying. And there are certain demographics that are more vulnerable to the COVID and the dangers of COVID. People with underlying health issues, more vulnerable. People of a certain age. Well, the last thing you want to do as a church is to make those people not feel welcomed within the church. You want to demonstrate, hey, we love you guys. You've got health. I like, you know, if you're 22 and you're healthy, you're not that worried about COVID. Right now, you should be worried about getting it and spreading it to people who are more vulnerable. But the point is, you may not see the risk, but you know what you should be doing as a Christian? You should be like, you know what? I don't want to create strife. I don't want to create division. We need unity, right? We need unity. We need, we need to see what we can do to demonstrate love. Right? I I, I think I, I put this strife over unity. I, I think we could put this, the church focused on strife over love. How about showing love to the uh, people who, uh, you know, are vulnerable? Like, hey, I work, I, you know, look, if you come to this church, I'm going to have a mask on so that you you are not put in danger because I love you. I don't, I, even if you say I don't believe in the mask and I don't think, care about the mask, you would do whatever you think you can to show love and compassion for those people who are vulnerable. But no, 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 it's not about anybody else. It's about strife and divisiveness. And it's pretty much like, if you don't, I even saw Christians say this, well, if you don't like the way we do church, just stay home. How is that showing love to your fellow church members? How is that showing love to people who are vulnerable? That's that's just acting from a perspective of strife just to cause division. Where's the love? Where is it? Hey, we're going to have we're going to have in sur- uh, in-person services and we're not going and we're not going to have any masking or any social distancing. And hey, and if you get sick and die, not our fault. W- where is that scriptural? How is that even how does that even sound Christian? That sounds straight up evil. Usually like, you know, we, we've got a lot of different people in our church with a lot of different health issues. Okay, what can we do to keep them safe? What can we do to protect them? And, 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 I, and I hate that mentality. Well, we're not going to wear a mask. And if you don't like it, you just stay home. But at the same time, they argue, but we need to be in church together. We need unity. We need fellowship. We need community. But hey, if you don't like the way we do it, you just stay home. Like, how is that? Do you not see the, the complete contradiction in your statement? If you think everyone needs to be at church, then you've got to create an environment at the church that is safe as possible for everyone. <laughs> and if you don't create an environment that's safe for everyone, then you don't care about those people that it's not safe 
four. That, like that, that's, that's, that's just strife for strife's sake. That's just vain glory. That's not considering others. You got to do what you can. In some cases, you got to do what's best for the community, and that may mean not having service services. And when you do have services, you try to do everything you can to make people feel as safe and as 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 welcomed as possible. But I've I've watched it. Oh, oh you're going to tell me we have to wear a mask? Well, we're not going to come. We're just not going to come. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being so godly and helpful during a pandemic. There's nothing like Christians being godly and helpful during a pandemic instead of just saying, we don't, we're not, we don't care about anybody else. No, how about you care about other people? How about you show up because you showing up wearing a mask, right? Even though you don't want to, is showing the other people around you that, hey, you love them and that you're going to do everything you can so that the church can meet and that everyone can feel safe there. But... You, it's almost like it's like pastors are like, uh, could could you pl- could you please wear a ma- mask? Okay, never mind, never mind, never mind. Because they know the minute they say the words, "Hey, we need everyone to wear a mask," it's like kill the pastor, down with the tyrant, destroy him, or just basically tell you we're not going to come, we're not going to uh, we're not going to be at church until you get rid of that stupid mask mandate. Well, because you don't care about other people. It's that like you can't get around it. You're, on, you're just creating strife for strife's sake. You're not going to just go along to help everyone. That's how the church is focused. That is a mistake, All right? Now, one more, because we're over an hour. One more. So let's go through the four so far. Focused on rights over ministry and service. Focused on money over principles. Focused on politics over scripture. Focused on strife over unity. And then lastly, focused on fraudulent conspiracy theories over truth. The church became the source of fraudulent conspiracy theories over fraudulent claims, over making claims without even understanding what that claim means, that 99% survivability rate, 99% survivability rate. Okay, well, let's let's take that. Okay, that's your claim. First, you got to even figure out how are you determining this? Are you determining it by the number of people infected with the number of people are dying? Well, you got to look at the number of people infected in the United States of America. How many people die? What does that come out to? Are you sure you're doing your math right? Are you doing Christian math? Are you sure you're doing it correctly? How are you determining the 99% survivability rate? And even if you have a, a 99% survivability rate, if you take the population of America and you, and you get most of those people infected, even at a 1% death rate, what would that number be? Is that okay with you? Is that no big deal? And when, and since when did we worry about the survivability rate? There's a mass shooting in a church and churches are like, we need armed guards. Everyone should own a gun. Well, what's your chances of dying in a mass shooting in your church? What's the survivability rate? Right? But what is it? What, you, 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 you say, I've got to own a gun to protect my family. What are the chances of you being killed in your home because of a home invasion? What's the survivability rate? What, what's, your, what's your survivability rate of not wearing a seatbelt? But you wear a seatbelt. You went with that law. Why don't you overthrow that law? Like, like there's just this all kinds of weird inconsistency and in even trying to figure, the churches are just making all kinds of claims. And sometimes the claims don't even make any sense. Fraudulent claims, wrong claims, claiming things are a hoax, bearing false witness. The church started doing, the church became a source of misinformation. During a time of a global pandemic, the church became a source of disinformation, misinformation, fraudulent information. So we were violating the very scripture that says, speak the truth put away lying, do not bear false witness. We couldn't even get that right in the middle of a pandemic. Christians became the source of fraudulent information and hoaxes and fraudulent videos and fraudulent, you know, graphs that supposedly showed statistics and then you start looking at it like, that's not even accurate. But, but you can't get Christians to stop. They continue and they continue and they continue and they continue to make these mistakes. Right, so let's go through them one more time. One more time. I got I closed my notebook. I got to see where I wrote these down at. Give me one second. Yeah, here we go. 
Number one, focused on rights over ministry and service. Number two, focused on money over principles. Number three, focused on politics over scripture. Number four, focused on strife over unity or focused on strife over love. Number five, focused on fraudulent conspiracy theories over truth. And that is the sad state of affairs. And and the pandemic has served as an x-ray to 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 show our brokenness. What we need to do is repent of this, figure out how we ended up in such a horrible mess and get back to acting like Christians and getting back to acting and following biblical principles so that 2021, maybe the church can uh, act in a way that's more glorifying to God and, and demonstrate salt and light to a world who desperately needs some salt and light. All right, I'll stop right there. You can email me your thoughts. Newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Everyone have a great day. God bless.